We've always been a really close-knit family. We live in an area where we could be close to my family so that they can help me with school whilst I was working. So I'm a single parent and it was always just very normal to have grandparents around as far as I was aware. We'd have meals, Sunday lunches together, Christmases, Easter, all of those things. We would spend that time together. It was really nice to be able to have my children around their grandparents. We were all just very happy, although there were always tensions with my children going to my parents' house. Uh, They would always just start playing up, didn't really want to go, and I just couldn't work out what the problem was. So now looking back, you know, you can, you think you can probably see that things weren't quite normal, as you put it. So take us back, if you can, just take us back to the moment that you first remember now, realising that something must be wrong. It was just coming up to Easter. I'd pre-warned the girls and said, you know, this is what we were going to do. We're going over to my parents, a very important part of our faith. And then as it got closer, my eldest daughter was saying, right, you know, I I don't want to go. We had an argument and she got more upset. And I said to her, look, I don't understand what's the problem that you have with my mum, because that's who I always thought the arguments came about. The the misbehaviour always seemed to be aimed at my mum. She was crying and she got upset and uh, she said, it's not your mum, it's your dad. He's a weirdo. I just said, oh, go to your room. I'm not listening to that. And my dad is the best man you can ever have. He does everything for me. And you don't understand how special he is to me. And so she went off to her room, but I was sitting in the lounge and started crying and she was crying upstairs. And then I just heard one of my other daughters say, why won't you just listen to her? And I don't really remember what I thought at that stage, but it was just that phrase. And I thought, I've got to go and speak to her. Something's obviously going on. Never in my wildest dreams would I ever have thought that it would have been this. I went up to speak to her and I said, "Um, look, what is it? What's happening? And she just said, it's your dad. He touches me. And I said, well, in what way does he, what do you mean by that? You mean just having cuddles? And she said, no, he touches me. And he does it to my sister as well. We had a chat and because I was training at the time in school nursing, I was very aware of safeguarding, very aware of of child abuse. And I think it was probably on my radar a lot more at that time because I was learning about it. So I thought, oh golly, you know, how am I going to do this and talk to them about what touching meant? So with my younger daughter, I used one of her (laughs) Barbie dolls and then I just got her to sort of point out what the touching was and then I drew little stick people which I subsequently handed to the police. I got her and my other daughter to actually circle where the touching had taken place just to try and establish, you know, was this something the children had maybe misinterpreted? I suppose in the back of my mind, I was hoping that's what it was, but it never crossed my mind that it wasn't true. And when when your eldest daughter said to you, he touches me, what on earth went through your mind at that point? I think I just went into nurse mode and it was a phrase I often used afterwards. I completely believe you, but it's just so difficult to believe. Because this was your father, yeah, your own yeah, father. Yeah, a man who I was in complete awe of. I think I probably looked at him as being above all other men. So, of course, then, to hear my daughter say he touches me and he's a weirdo, I had to sort of compartmentalise the sort of being a daughter and being a nurse and being a mother and just try and be that school nurse for the moment with a child who was disclosing to me. And then once I'd sort of done that, I I went downstairs and I think in the best possible way, I, <laughs> I howled just because 
I just could not understand. I was trying to process everything so quickly, just trying to understand what this man had done and why he'd done it to my children. It was really difficult, really difficult. Interesting word you used, howled, almost like a sort of animal reaction almost. Yeah, it really was. It really was. I remember the children coming in saying, Mummy, and it didn't feel like me. I could just hear this noise coming out of me. It was almost like, you know, that was something else. So it was just this real raw emotion that just came out of me at the shock of it and suddenly felt very, very alone. I don't know how long I stayed like that for, but, you know, I stayed like that just on my own with this horrible emotion, really, that I just didn't know what to do with. And... Just tell me, how old were your children at this point when they told you what had happened? My eldest was seven when the first incident happened and then that carried on intermittently until she was 11. My youngest daughter, so by the time she was 11, my youngest daughter was seven and then it started again with her until she was coming up to secondary school. And so you were reacting in a very professional way. The words coming out of your mouth were those of a professional nurse by training. Inside your head, though, what were you thinking when you realised that, you know, this, these were your two daughters, your father's grandchildren, that this had happened to? I was falling apart. It was like my whole world was just crashing down. I was angry. I was scared myself. I was just in this state of shock and sort of not sure what on earth to think. This is someone who I've obviously grown up with, completely adored. I've championed him all my life. My dad is the best. He's brilliant. He does this, this and this. And it was crumbling very, very quickly. Mm. So just tell us, what kind of man was your father when you were growing up? Did you, you know, looking back now, did you ever have any suspicions about him? I've never felt uncomfortable as far as I can recall. Nothing ever happened to me specifically. There was an incident where I was in my mum's pyjamas and I remember him stroking them. But when you know something like this has happened, you look back and it's almost like, come on brain, remember, remember, did anything happen? Was there anything in my childhood that would make me think that this has happened to me? Has it happened to any of my friends? To me, he was always a very loving dad. So you you wanted to impress him, you trusted him to the hilt, you, you adored him, really? Yeah, a- absolutely, yeah, I did, I did. So now knowing what he did to your daughters, give us a sense of the scale of betrayal. It's enormous, I mean... He's completely ruined not only their childhood, but mine. My whole life, it has been marred by it. You feel that you were somehow in some way sort of living a lie yeah. looking back on your childhood? Yeah. because how can you suddenly decide to abuse children? To me, I don't understand that. And it's so difficult because I would have conversations with my father about absolutely everything. And now, looking back... I sort of reflect on his reactions to things. If things came up about abuse, like historical abuse, I'd say, that's awful, I'm glad it's in the paper. And I would never get that reaction from him, which always, it sort of unsettled me a little bit. I thought, oh, you know, it's an unusual reaction. Again, that was only really when I started to do nursing because you are so aware during your training of safeguarding and what to look for and grooming and all of these things. By his actions, he's he's just crushed me, really. Really has. His lawyer said that he was himself abused. Does that change your view at all? I think the hardest thing, being a daughter, which I don't like, is the guilt you carry. When he said that, my first reaction, my head was like on a pivot, really. And my first thoughts were, my poor dad. And I hate I thought that, but that was just a natural thing because of, I suppose, who I am. 
I thought, oh my gosh, he's been through that. But then in that split second from what the lawyer then followed that up with, you know, we know that abused become abusers. It's like, no, that's wrong. It's the same as saying, well, if someone stole something, then that means I'll go and steal something. Yeah, there are statistics which show that, but it doesn't mean it's right and it doesn't mean that that's an okay way to be. And you said your instant reaction when you heard the lawyer say that was, my poor dad. Do you feel, do you still love him? Can you feel that emotion towards him? No, 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 you can't. How can you love someone who's completely broken your trust, broken your heart? The impact, the psychological impact on my children and me has been enormous. So no, I can't, I can't love him. And you've said that he has ruined your daughter's childhoods. What, what impact are you seeing on them, on you now? You've talked about the enormous psychological impact. Can you give us a sense of what repercussions there are all of them suffer with anxiety sleep problems um, bad dreams recurring dreams uh, flashbacks my youngest daughter self-harmed they struggle with school attending school their self-confidence was rock bottom and that's ongoing and do they blame do they blame you no i don't think they've ever blamed me actually they're very close to each other They had a pact that they wouldn't tell anyone. They didn't want to tell me they were protecting me because they knew how close I was to my family. They decided that they weren't going to say anything until he was dead. On reflection, I remember my eldest being very upset when he was quite poorly before this came out, saying, is he going to die? And I was like, oh gosh, no, no, of course he's not. No, he's going to be fine, don't worry. When actually having spoken to her since then, she said, well, that's what we were waiting for. And for children under the age of 13 to be waiting for your grandfather to die so that they can relieve the burden of what he has done, it's just horrendous. And when they told you what had been happening, was there anyone you could confide in? Did you? What did you do? Did you immediately call the police? What happened? No, so... It was quite late at night, so we tried to all go to sleep and the next day was school, so I spoke to the girls, you know, what do you want to do? We need to tell someone about this, it's really important. They were worried, they were really anxious about it and didn't really want anyone else to know, so so I sort of drove around where we lived and I almost went to my parents' house and I thought maybe I'll confront him. I thought, right, okay, I'll go to school. So I went to the primary school and walked through to speak to the head teacher and kind of collapsed in a bit of a heap, actually, bless them. They didn't know, obviously. I just said, you know, my daughter's disclosed something. I sat down and spoke to the head teacher. They were amazing, so patient. And because I was sobbing and shaking, they just sat me down, a cup of tea, just talked to me and said, we need to report this which I was happier to do that way and it felt safer to do it that way than call the police. Very bravely, my daughter had actually disclosed herself to her school. So she went into the pastoral team at the same time. So then it all sort of went off into an emergency strategy meeting, which is between the police and the social workers, uh, the school, the school nurses. Everybody's brought in on those strategy calls and that's when the social workers and police got involved. Just tell us about the police process. How did that work in terms of what your daughters said to the police and how you were involved? Yeah, they were really good initially. Uh, We were called in and we had to go down to this special sort of house, really. It was like a little house and we went in there and the girls had to do their video statements It was almost like sitting in a lounge. The police officer sits opposite you and there's a video recorder going on, so the whole interview is recorded. The female officer was asking questions whilst we were sat outside. So I wasn't involved in those. I I didn't go in with the girls at all and I didn't watch the interviews. 
Before they started, the police officer said to us and the social worker was there, from these interviews, we will decide whether we'll bring him in for questioning or whether he'll be arrested. It was almost like watching someone else's case go forward. It was very odd and obviously the girls were really, really nervous. But the atmosphere was lovely, it was calm and it was very comfortable. It was just like being in someone's house. And then what happened after that? How did the girls react? How did they cope with that? I think it was a massive relief. I mean, it's taken two and a half years to get to sentencing. And at that time, when they did their interviews, they thought, right, this is it. We're doing everything that we need to do. We're telling the police, we're handing it over to them and they'll deal with it. And then it just dragged and dragged and dragged. I think the biggest delay was with the Crime Prosecution Service. Our police officer, who ended up being our liaison officer, was brilliant. But the process was painful and the girls got more and more fed up with it, really. And I just thought, well, nothing's going to be done because no one's doing anything about it. And how long after their first interview was he arrested? So he was arrested that night. Unfortunately, there was a bit of an error with the social worker. We were told that he would be arrested and I was asked if I'd like to talk to my brother and my ex-husband or would it be helpful if she would do that? And I said, oh no, would you talk to my brother? And she said, yes, I'll speak to him once he's been arrested. And I was like, okay, that's great. And so on the way home, I get this call from my brother very, very angry. You know, what's going on? I've had a call from a social worker saying our dad's been arrested. Well, he hasn't been arrested because I've just phoned him and asked him if he's been arrested. Oh, my word. Yeah, we went into panic mode and I was like, right, I mean, we had to hide in McDonald's, <laughs> sadly. Because you were fearful. Yeah, I thought, how can I go home now? I, I don't know how he or my mum are going to react to this. And he had three hours before he was arrested. That's terrible. By which point... He was arrested and then he was on bail, which was horrible, being in the same area. The girls would see him driving past in the car. I saw him on the day I was told that his bail was dropped. And I said, but he still can't come anywhere near us, can he? Surely that's not an appropriate thing for him to do. And I was reassured that, no, he knows that. And literally hours after that conversation, we passed in the car And I just completely lost my senses, really. I got out of the car. He had gone, but I was on the phone to the police officer straight away and screaming and shouting down the phone saying, he's here, he's just gone past me, what do I do? My daughter was off sick at the time and I grabbed her and I put her in the car and it was horrible. That was the first time and actually the last time I saw him before I saw him in the Crown Court. What did your mum say about everything? It's very difficult with my mum. I think she's struggling a lot. And I don't really want her to sort of struggle, really, with it. After this terrible experience of waiting so long for justice and these terrible mistakes um, that you say were made, to see your father jailed, what went through your mind at that moment when you were sitting in court and you saw him go to prison? It was relief. I just thought, yeah, we did it. He underestimated my children and I'm a complete advocate that children have a voice and their voice needs to be heard. And through their strength and that little phrase, why won't you listen to her? Although it's been hell on earth for the last two and a half years whilst we've been waiting and waiting, the relief when he was actually sentenced was immense I broke down crying. I did. I did apologise to my ex-husband. I just said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. He's and he's just saying, what are you sorry for? And I said, this should never have happened because it should never, ever have happened to anybody. But it sounds as if you're blaming yourself for something that your dad did. Yeah, I know, I know. There is a lot of guilt there because it was my decision to move closer to them. It was my decision to be okay about leaving my youngest daughter there and she had the sort of more, if there's any scale of abuse, it's all the same, but it was more consistent. I'm their mum, I'm meant to be their protector and I just wish that 
I had known somehow or maybe delved into it a bit deeper about why. Why didn't they get on with my mum? When I picked my daughter up from when I finished work, I'd be always asked to sit down and have a cup of tea, but sit down, have some dinner, and my daughter would start messing about and being rude and playing up, basically, so that I would then go, right, fine, forget it, we'll go home. And having spoken about it since, I said, why did you do that? And she's like, because I didn't want to stay there any longer. I feel that as a parent, I can give that to other parents to maybe look for if there is anything there, if they are behaving strangely. Um, you know, don't wait and just talk to them. Try and encourage children to talk. Maybe not sit on their phones and talk, <laughs> um, but to actually talk to you. And when you broke down in court, did you did you look at him? Did Did he look at you? No, no. He looked over a couple of times during the whole process because I was looking at him and thinking, that's my dad in there. And trying to see my dad rather than just seeing this man sitting there admitting what he'd done and sitting there thinking, that's actually my dad. How can that be my dad sat there? And it was it just horrible to see him. I caught his eye, but then he looked away when he was told to be taken away. Apparently, he didn't look at us. I didn't look over at him. He just looked down at the ground, apparently, and went out. If he was in front of you now, what would you want to say to him? Why? Why? Why could you do that? Why do people do this? I don't understand it. I don't understand it. And I've thought about that. Would I be able to go and have that face-to-face -face conversation with him and actually ask him, why did he do it? And also, had he done it before? Do you think he did? I don't know. I think if he hadn't, that would have been down to lack of opportunity. I can't understand why you'd turn 60 and do those things. So not just one child, but two, and not just once. You have faith. Forgiveness is part of that faith. Can you ever think about no. forgiving him? No. My faith is completely rocked. I don't think I can believe in a God who chose someone like that. No amount of remorse will change what he's done. Okay, he's going to have psychiatric help and people do reform. I don't think you can reform from something like that. If that's in your nature, it's just so hard. No, I'll never forgive him. And he's jailed for over eight years. But in theory, he will at some point be free. Because he admitted guilt at the earliest opportunity, he only has to serve four years and two months. He needed to have a custodial. I was very worried at one point that he would get a suspended sentence. In theory, you could see him again in a few years. How does that strike you? I won't. They moved away, so I won't see them, him again, really. You think about those things, don't you? You know, would I go to his funeral or anything like that? The minute I knew what he'd done to my children, everything that I knew of my father had died. He's not your father, in your view? No. How can he be my father? OK, you might be by genetics and blood, but no, I'd rather not say that I had a father. But then, on the other hand, I want to be brave enough to say, you know what, I do have a father and he's in jail. And he's in jail because he sexually abused my children. And do you blame your mum at all for... You know, she must have known what was happening. I don't think she knew. I don't think she knew. I've spoken to her since. Obviously, she doesn't know the details because she finds it hard to cope with that. But when I said, it's ironic, really, that he got eight years when that was the total amount of time that he abused the girls, that really shocked her. I don't know. I, I haven't had that conversation face to face since he's been sentenced where I've been able to talk to her. You've several times mentioned a really haunting phrase that one of your other daughters said, why won't you listen to her? I just wondered if that goes to the heart of why you've decided to speak to us today, to encourage other people to listen and to act. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There's lots of help that children can get 
there's lots of platforms like Cooth and Chat Health, which is with school nurses. But children are scared to say anything. Abuse is like a virus. It infects the victims and it stays with them forever. So I want to be able to speak up about it and show children that there's nothing to be ashamed of and empowering children to speak up and to speak out about what's happened to them. Now that can be adult survivors, that can be historical abuse or that can be someone who's been abused yesterday or today. There is someone there who will listen to them and I think also by speaking about our story, I want to be able to give parents the confidence to actually spot issues. When my children were younger or going to secondary school, there was a lot about things you might spot around drugs and drug use, but no one actually said to me, how do you know if your child's being abused? Because you would just think, well, that would never happen. So you think the signs were there if you had only been aware of what they oh, were? Oh, yeah. Yeah, on reflection, they were there. The way the children behaved, certainly when we moved closer, the way they behaved when we went round there, I can see now that they didn't want to be there. The anger and bad behaviour was mainly aimed at my mum. And my eldest has actually said, well how can I love your mum when she's with someone like that? And that really sort of pulls at your heartstrings because you think, gosh, you know, not only have they lost one grandparent, they've lost both of them, really, because they see that as not being a safe place. You've spoken so movingly and, and so honestly about how your own father ha has ruined your children's lives and ruined your life. Can you ever hope to rebuild your lives together? Yeah, we're taking it day by day, really. I think we all naively thought that once the case was closed, I think we all thought that that would be it. That's it, over, and we can move on. And actually, we tumbled backwards a little bit. Recurrent dreams are coming out a bit more. The girls, I think, are releasing some of that anxiety and some of the emotions and trying and are trying now to address that. I've been quite keen to get them counselling and for the last two and a half years you know you've got to talk to someone you've got to talk and they've shut down I don't want to talk to anyone I don't want to talk about it anymore I've done my talking I've spoken to the police I've done it and, and that's it whereas then I'm thinking of the psychological impact this is just going to go on and they're not going to have dealt with it and they're going to go into their early teens and late teens and be in relationships all these sorts of worries as a parents sort of happen anyway but when you know something like that has happened to your children it sort of manifests a little bit and you just think oh gosh how are they going to cope and then my eldest daughter said to me I'm talking to someone and I was like brilliant that's great and then my youngest has just started to thankfully have socially distanced but face-to-face -face contact Children won't benefit from counselling unless they're actually ready to have it. And I think now, thankfully, whilst they're still teenagers, they're actually saying, yeah, OK, we'll do this and we'll talk to people. And you, how are you coping? I'm very lucky in that I've got very good friends. My childhood friend I grew up with is my permanent counsellor. She's really, really helped. And my work colleagues have been amazing. And my friends locally have all been really lovely. But I need counselling. I know that I need to have some in-depth counselling, really, to help me deal with my childhood, I guess, and my past. And then to start being able to look forward and be that supportive and protective mother that I've always tried to be. Jessica, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for listening.